Hello, and welcome to the American Family Insurance Dream Bank, where we believe in the transformative power of dreams. My name is Eric Lopez, and I am a dream curator here at Dream Bank. And on behalf of our team, we're glad to have you with us. Here at American Family Insurance, we believe communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why we created Dream Bank, an inspirational community destination and digital experience dedicated to dreamers everywhere. Our offerings are designed to help you celebrate the dream journey, overcome obstacles, and stay motivated. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Miranda. Braithwaite. <laughs> Dr. Braithwaite is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and a, with a doctorate in veterinary medicine and a master's in public health. She is a passionate human, she is passionate about the human animal bond and centers her work on maintaining this bond as we help our pets to age with grace. She spends her days providing in home veterinary care, hospice, and euthanasia via her mobile practice, Sage Pet Home Veterinary Care. If you have any questions for our speaker, uh, please write them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to them at the end. Uh, before we start, I would also like to mention this event will be recorded and you'll be able to find our event on Facebook and YouTube in this week. Now, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, everybody, for being here today, taking some time out of your Wednesday to chat with me about my favorite topic, which is how we can optimize the quantity and quality of life for our pets so that they can age with grace and dignity and they can live their best, best lives. So to talk a little bit about where we're going to go today, we're going to be talking about quantity and quality of life. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we define those things and sort of what we're looking at when we're talking about quantity and quality of life for our pets, obviously with some emphasis on the quality. We're going to talk about some preventative care measures you can do to help your pets stay healthy, some adaptations you can make to your home to make life easier for your aging pets. Some warning signs to look out for that may signal a sign of disease or that you need to talk to your veterinarian. A little bit about how we manage chronic disease. And then a little bit about how I believe care is better done at home and some methods for fear-free fear veterinary care. So just some terms to get us started here. What the realm that I work in is called veterinary medicine. And we use that term in contrast to human medicine. So when you go out and you meet with your doctor, talk with your physician, that's called human medicine. And that's the term we use in my field to kind of differentiate the two. In veterinary medicine, since we have two beings that we're working with, we have a term to define each of those. So we use the term client, that's you, the pet owner, the pet parent, and then we talk about the patient being your pet. So just some terms to help us navigate this field. All right, so to get started, the big question we all wanna know, so this is my old lady hound dog, Polly, and she really wants to know, what is the quantity of life? How long can your pet truly live? I feel like there are a lot of different ideas out in the world about what means old for our pets. And oftentimes I hear people kind of underestimating how long their pet can live. So let's talk about it. So for cats, there's some really nice life stage guidelines broken out for cats. We talk about kittenhood being up to one year, young adults being up to six years. Then we really start to see some aging changes happening when they become mature adults or seniors. So mature adults happens around seven years of age and we consider them seniors above about 10 years of age. But you'll notice here at the bottom that it says end of life is variable because that's really true. There's lots of things that are gonna go into that. On average, I would say, I see many, many cats living well into their teens. I see plenty of 16, 17, 18 year old cats that are doing well. I've met 20 year old cats um, and I've met a 25 year old cat who is still thriving. So um, it is possible for them to live into their late teens. And I would say for me, my goal is always to get a cat healthily to 20 years of age. That being said, the oldest living documented cat is Cream Puff here, who died at the age of 38, which I think is pretty incredible. And I've never seen a cat get to the 30s. Um, here's another diagram I just wanted to bring up. This is created by the American Association of Feline Practitioners, which is a group of veterinarians who are dedicated specifically to cat care. Um, and they create a lot of good uh, educational material and handouts for pet parents as well. And I just took a little bit of this snippet from the bottom half of this chart that compares cat years to human years. We always hear that dog year is one human year and seven dog years. This one actually is closer to four. So one human year for um, 
one cat year for every four human years. And you can see when we're looking at the teens, we're looking at 16, 17, 18 years of age. That's the late 70s, early 80s for a human. And certainly that's a life expectancy that we can expect for our cats. Now we talk about dogs. And for dogs, things get a little bit trickier. Cats are a bit more standardized, right? They're all about the same size. There's not a ton of breed variation while there are purebred cats. They're not as common as your standard domestic house cat, which is essentially just a mutt. So they're very similar in what we can expect for their age. Dogs are trickier because we have this guy, right? Our two to three year old or two to three pound little Chihuahua friend, all the way up to this guy, right? This is Zeus. Um, he's the the world's documented tallest dog. He stands over seven feet tall when he stood up all the way. And these things are the same species. And so it's really hard for us to say for sure exactly how long a dog should live because there's so many things that go into it. So certainly size is a factor. Smaller dogs are gonna live longer. Like that little chihuahua we just looked at, he's probably gonna live into his teens or twenties just like a cat might. The bigger a dog gets, the shorter their life expectancy. And our friend Zeus here actually died at the age of five, which is really quite young, but he was a really big guy. Other things that can go into that are certainly breed issues and breed predispositions. Dogs are much more um, segregated in their breeding in terms of specific breeds. And each one of those breeds comes with its own set of genetics and its own set of genetic issues that can pop up and that can affect lifespan. So it's hard to say exactly how long dogs can live. I would say on average, we can get to the early teens with our dog friends, depending upon their breed and their other health issues. The longest lived dog that I could find uh, was Bluey, who was in Australia. He died in the 1930s. And so I don't have a good picture of him, but he was a cattle dog, just like my friend Cash here. Um, and he lived to be 29 years of age. So we don't just see dogs and cats. I certainly don't just see dogs and cats. I love seeing other small friends too. So when we look at those, we have things like rats, for example. Rats have a very small lifespan. They usually live two to three years if we're really lucky. Other small things like gerbils and hamsters have a similar lifespan. It's really quite short. Um, snakes. This here is my friend who's a ball python. Ball pythons in captivity can live up to 30 years of age. So they can be really, really quite long lived. Other reptiles like tortoises can live to be extremely old. And then other reptiles and amphibians too. One thing that's really important determinant in their quantity of life is their care. They have very specific care requirements and that can really impact how long they live. And then another common pet I see, the rabbit, those guys tend to live somewhere between eight to 12 years of age. So that's what we're looking at in terms of quantity. That's what we can expect. That's what our goals are. That's what we're shooting for. But then we have to talk about quality, which this is the good stuff. This is the stuff that we really care about, right? This is the joy. This is the fun. This is the snuggles. This is all the really good stuff. When we talk about quality of life, from a veterinary medicine perspective, we're looking at a lot of stuff. We're looking at mobility, pain, appetite, social interactions with other animals, but also with their people and with their family, hygiene, all of that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into determining a pet's quality of life. When you're thinking about your pet's quality of life, there are many different tools and scales out there that you can reference. You can find many options out on the internet. But another really good resource, which this is going to be a theme throughout my whole talk, is your local friendly veterinarian. Um, I think it's really important to have quality of life discussions with your veterinarian. There are discussions that these guys are trained to have. Some of us, I really enjoy having these conversations, and I think they're really important because they really get to the meat of, of what matters in your pet's life. Um, and while if a pet has a decline in quality of life, we do have the option of euthanasia or a peaceful passing for our pets. That's something we can give them as a gift. It doesn't always mean a decline in quality of life doesn't always mean we have to go to euthanasia. It just means something has changed and something is different. And often there are interventions and changes and treatments that we can do to boost that quality of life back up again and to improve things. The other thing I will say is that we don't only have to think about quality of life at end of life. We can think of quality of life kind of early and often, I say. We should always be thinking about our pet's quality of life, how we can improve it, how we can change it. And certainly if we ever have any concerns to talk um, about that with our veterinarians. So we know how long we can live. We know we wanna have a good quality of life for our pets. So what can we do to maximize that time and to help them age with grace? 
So preventative care is a big part of the equation. Preventative care is the regular veterinary care that your pet's gonna get to help prevent issues, help slow progression of any diseases, and to treat any problems that can come up because our pets are gonna age, their bodies are gonna change and decline, and often they need some help propping some things up and solving some problems along the way. So I mentioned before the American Association of Feline Practitioners, this is one of the handouts that they make for pet parents. Um, they make a lot of really good ones. And then there's a similar the American Animal Hospital Association that makes recommendations for dogs as well. So when we're talking about preventative care for seniors, the recommendation is really that they should have a minimum of an exam with a veterinarian every six months. As we saw earlier with that chart with the kitty cats, one year of life for a cat is like four years of life for a human. And some may say that one year for a dog is seven years for a human. So a lot can happen in that time and a lot can change. And so it's important for a veterinarian to get their hands on the animal in that time and see if there are any changes, especially because our pets can't talk to us, right? They can't tell us what's going on. And so we need to kind of look into that every so often. Part of uh, the preventative care that I think can be a mystery for pet owners is, you know, you bring your pet into the veterinary clinic, we feel them all up, we look at them with all these instruments, and it's kind of like a black box. You're not really sure what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're looking for. So I'm going to walk through some of the things that are looked for at these preventative care exams. But again, I think it's really important to have that good relationship with your veterinarian, have a veterinarian with whom you feel you can ask questions and, and um, dig into a little deeper about what they're doing and then ask those questions, ask what they're looking for, ask if they're finding any issues um, and really develop that conversation with them. So some of the things we're looking for at an exam, weight, certainly we're looking for weight changes because that can be a big indicator in disease. Both increases and decreases in weight are important. Listening to the heart and the lungs to note any changes there, specifically for our canine friends. Um, there are several breeds of dogs that are prone to heart changes and heart disease as they age. And that's one of the things that if we catch it really early, we can do a fabulous job of preventing and slowing the progression of the disease and making it a problem much later in life than it would have been otherwise. We squish around in their bellies, which they don't always love, but it's really quite important. So some of the things that I'm looking for in a kitty cat, for example, I can feel their kidneys and I can see if they're an appropriate size or maybe they're too small or too big, which can indicate kidney disease. We look for any lumps or bumps in their liver or their intestines that might indicate that something gross is brewing in there. And we look certainly for any signs of pain or discomfort because that can be really important. We're assessing for signs of joint pain. This one's huge in our aging pets. Um, the vast majority of our aging pets are gonna get some joint disease. And so it's important for us to be assessing for that because obviously that's something if they're in pain, we wanna intervene right away and slow that joint disease down. For kitty cats, it's very common for them to get pain in their lower back. So we'll feel along there. We'll also try to flex and extend every joint, which is often much easier done in a dog than in a cat, but we're looking for any signs of abnormal sounds like clicking in the joints, any swelling, any pain, and then any decreased range of motion. So we have a sense of exactly how far every joint should flex and extend, and we can see if any of that's decreased from where it should be. We're looking at a body map often in our older pets. Older pets commonly get lumps and bumps. And what a body map is, I'll show you a picture later, um, is just a 2D image of a dog or a cat where we mark on there where we found the lumps and bumps, how big they were, what they looked like, so that we can track those over time if there's any changes. We look for any cognitive changes. So changes in their attitude or how they're responding to things and certainly any changes at home in terms of changes in their training or loss of uh, ba uh, bathroom habits or anything like that. Breed specific screening, like we talked about before, certain breeds are prone to certain diseases. And so it's important to know what those are for your pet um, and to make sure that they're being evaluated at these exams. In addition to the exam every six months for our senior pets, I also really, really push for lab work every year. So lab work is gonna look at a lot of stuff that we can't see with the naked eye. It's gonna look for signs of infection or inflammation in our blood cell counts. We're looking at kidney values, liver values, signs of thyroid disease or electrolyte abnormalities. All of these things are really important to look for because they can subtly change over time. 
And so we'll have, if you do it yearly for your pet, you have a comparison of where they were before, what things looked like for them when they were healthy, because each pet is an individual and there's no standard of exactly what it should look like. And then it helps us catch changes early. Something like kidney disease in a kitty cat, for example, which is very common. If we catch that when there are some very minimal changes, we can really intervene and make some changes and slow the progression of that disease. Okay, so that's medical care. What can you do at home to help your pet live a more comfortable life as they age and as they have some changes? Um, this, <laughs> this little friend here is Missy, who is a little Pomeranian, and I believe she's, she's 16 at this point, and she's still doing all right. Um, so one of the biggest changes that we see as pets age is a change in their mobility. And this is particularly true for, for our dogs. They get arthritis, they get weak, um, they can get some nerve degeneration as they age, especially in our bigger breed dogs like Labradors, and they can lose some strength in their hind limbs as a result of that. And so that can create some issues getting around. So we wanna make sure they have good traction. So something like these toe grips, which actually glue onto the nails can help provide really good traction. We wanna think about things like ramps, for example, to get in and out of the car or to up and down off the furniture. They also make really great harnesses with handles and things to help your dogs get around um, if they're losing their mobility. We think about mobility loss in dogs, but it also happens in cats. Um, one of the biggest places where we see issues with mobility in our kitty cats as they age is in the litter box. Litter boxes, especially tall sided ones, can be really hard for cats to get in and out of if they have any arthritis. So this is a nice box for an older kitty. It's got a nice little cutout to help the cat get in and out. Something else to think about is, since I mentioned before that cats can get pain in their lower back, they have to arch their back in order to use the litter box. And sometimes that can get painful, so they stand up more and that can cause them to overshoot and kind of think outside the box. And so if they have a larger footprint or a bigger box, that can be really helpful. Um, other things to look for for mobility changes in cats, one of the biggest one is changes in jumping. So our cats that get back pain don't like to jump up anymore because they don't wanna arch the back. Or if they're jumping down off the counter, for example, instead of just going for it, they'll kind of slowly inch their way down. Those can be signs of mobility decline or joint disease. The other thing to think about as a factor that increases the chance of joint disease is whether or not a cat is declawed. Pretty much 90 to 100% of cats who have had their claws removed will have arthritis as a result of that procedure later in life. Other adaptations at home that you can think about to help make life easier for your aging pet. They can lose vision as they age, especially night vision. So you wanna think about illuminating things. For example, if you have a litter box in a basement for your cat, for example, and it's dark down there, you might wanna put in a nightlight to help them see. Um, if you have a pet that's losing vision, Pets tend to tolerate that really well, and often we don't notice if they have mild vision changes. And so one way they'll navigate is they'll actually memorize the floor plan. And so if you have a pet that's losing vision, it's a good idea to not move your furniture very frequently so that they can navigate that. Don't leave things in, in hallways and walkways that they're used to using. And then also pets are really routine creatures, and that becomes so much more true as they age. They really kind of dig into those routines. And so keeping those routines the same, having a similar way that things are done every day can really provide good comfort for your aging pets. Okay, so in addition to just having some adaptations to your home as your pet can age, there are some basic care things that you can do at home for your pet that really do make a big difference in their overall health and comfort as they age. And they're fairly simple things for you to tackle at home. The biggest one is weight management. And, and as veterinarians, we're always talking about this. And the reason it's so important for our aging pets is that their metabolism slows down. They don't get as much exercise, maybe because they have some arthritis. And so they're prone to gaining some weight. The other thing is that they have that joint disease. And the number one thing that makes joint disease hurt more is extra weight on the joints. And so it's really important that we keep them at a lean weight. So when we're talking about weight, veterinarians use what is called a body condition score. And that's what I have for you here. And we score the pets on this scale to give them a score of where their body condition is. You will see that in probably every one of your pet's exams if you get that sent home with you. I have occasionally given a nine out of nine and had people been very excited that their pet got a perfect score. But a nine out of nine is actually not the best score on this scale. The best score is a five out of nine. Sometimes a four is okay too. So what we're looking for, if you see that guy there in the middle that has a five, there's a nice tuck into the waist. When you're looking from the side or above, you see that 
waist tucks in nicely. That's a good lean body condition. The other thing that I look at, a little trick that I use, is I like to feel over the ribs on the side and feel how easy it is to feel them. If feeling the ribs is like feeling over the back of your hand and where you feel those bones, that's perfect. That's just what you want. If it feels like your knuckles, then they're obviously a bit too thin. The bones are sticking out too much. But if it feels like this mushy part of the heel of your hand, then we're closer to the seven, eight, nine territory and they're a little on the chubby side. So we really want to make sure to keep our pets lean, especially senior pets. Lean pets live longer, they hurt less, they move more, and they're less likely to get other chronic diseases like diabetes, for example. Something else you can do at home is still keep having lots of exercise, even for your elderly pets that help keeps the weight down, but it also helps keep them strong. Low impact exercise like walking is great, even for pets with joint disease. It helps keep the muscle strong, which support the joints. It helps lubricate the joints. It can be fabulous. So walking is great. Swimming is great. For our kitty cat friends, you can think of things like cat wheels. There are cats that will run on wheels, laser pointers like they have here, interactive like fishing line toys. All of that stuff can help get really good exercise and keep us moving as we age. Other things you can think about, there is physical therapy for pets as well. You don't have to go to physical therapy just because of an injury. You could go and learn some exercises. Let's say perhaps your dog has issues with its hips and its hips are painful. You could learn some exercises to help strengthen and stretch those hips to help keep your dog moving for longer. In addition to physical exercise, it's really important not to forget about the mental exercise. We got to keep those brains sharp. Uh, we really can slow cognitive decline in our pets if we keep them using their brains. Sometimes we have to get pretty creative with this, but there's lots of resources out there. One of them that I really like is called the Indoor Pet Initiative. That's through the Ohio State University. They have some great ideas for enrichment for your pets, specifically for cats as well. Um, I really like puzzle feeding toys. I mean, we feed our pets anyhow. Why not make it more difficult and exciting for them? So you can buy ones that have different compartments and things that they need to open. This is a simple snuffle mat. Um, it's a mat with lots of different projections and you hide little treats in there. Really great for scented dogs that are really into scent, like hound dogs, like these guys here. Um, the outdoors is its own enrichment, especially for kitty cats. Cats can go out on leashes or in catios or other ways that they can be outside and get the stimulation, but be safe. And then lots of different chews and treats and kind of changing things up can be really important for their stimulation. This is probably second to weight management. This is probably the other one that I see be neglected the most, but can actually have the biggest impact on the quality of life for your pet. So what happens in your pet's mouth throughout the day is they get bacteria on their teeth and that forms a plaque or a biofilm. That plaque mixes with the minerals in the saliva and hardens into tartar. That process only takes 24 hours, but once it's hardened into tar tartar, it can only be removed professionally, like, it, like what happened with you at the dentist. So what we wanna do is every 24 hours, we wanna interrupt that cycle, not let it harden by brushing. If we were to brush our pet's teeth every day, they would look great and they would never have any tartar. But obviously that's a little difficult. So there's some other things we can think about doing as well. The reason that that tartar is a problem is because it's essentially just hardened bacteria. So every time your pet's chewing, they're putting a bunch of bacteria into the bloodstream and that can actually prematurely age both the heart and the kidneys and it can cause body-wide inflammation. It can also eat away at the connection between the tooth and the bone, which leads to loose teeth, painful teeth, or infected teeth. And then we're looking at removal of the teeth, which in itself isn't such a big deal. Pets do fine without teeth. I have a cat with no teeth and he does great. Um, but they do have to undergo general anesthesia for those procedures, which while it is not necessarily always dangerous for our older pets, it can be a little more scary at the older that they get. So we think about daily brushing as being really important, but you can also get things like dental chews and treats, and they even make a really great dental diet. So you're feeding your pet anyway, why not feed them a diet that helps clean their teeth so that they can have a healthy pain-free mouth. Other things you can do at home to keep your pet healthy. As they age, our pets tend to groom less. And so we want to think about helping them out there. Our kitty cats specifically, they get really brittle nails as they age that don't shed. Cats' nails usually shed kind of like an onion skin. And as they age, that process can stop. 
And so the nails can overgrow and they can actually turn around and grow back into the paw pads, which can be really painful. So you wanna make sure you're keeping your kitty cat's nails nice and short. Every six to eight weeks is an appropriate time frame for cutting those. Cats will decrease their grooming of their fur, especially if they have any pain in that low back and they can't turn around to groom back there, they'll get matted fur. So you wanna make sure you're combing them to help with that. And then some of our longer haired kitty cats or kitty cats that are a little on the chubby side um, can have some troubles uh, cleaning their hind end and often that needs to be shaved and help to keep clean for them. For our dogs, similar sort of story, especially if they have a beautiful coat like my friend Archie here, they may need help with brushing and combing. Sometimes dogs can have some increased eye discharge as they age, they need help cleaning that away. And the nail trimming again is really, really important for our dogs. They don't have retractable claws like cats do, so the claws are always out. And if the claws overgrow in a dog and they touch the floor, that pushes on the, on the joints it misaligns the joints and it can go all the way up the leg and cause arthritis or cause worsening of arthritis just simply from having nails that are too long. So for dogs, I actually recommend their nails get cut a little more frequently than kitty cats and really every couple of weeks or so is appropriate for that. Okay, so now you have some things that you can do at home to help keep your pet comfortable, some care you can provide that really is gonna help increase your pet's quality of life. But sometimes you're gonna need to call your veterinarian because there's gonna be some issues and you're gonna need to talk those through. So the most important thing to know is what is normal for my pet. You know your pet really well. You have this preventative care relationship with your veterinarian. You're going in every six months for your regular exam. So your veterinarian knows your pet really well. And that's a great place to start. Other things that can help you know normal for your pet are meal feeding. So you feed them the same amount every day. You know if that their appetite is changing. You have a routine. You know their bathroom habits. You know their socialization habits. So if anything's out of the ordinary, you know you need to talk to your pet. And really, while some changes can be normal aging changes or changes we may just need to adapt to, any change is a change and it can be a sign of an underlying illness. One of the biggest ones I have folks watch out for is pain. I think most folks are good at noticing acute or short term pain. So that's, you know, uh, crying out, whining, limping, all of that stuff is pretty obvious. But the stuff that's harder to notice is the chronic pain. And that's more what we're worried about in our older pets. Pets are very stoic, they're wired for survival, and so they will hide pain. And so you have to sort of learn the signs to look for in your pet. Things to think about are, what do they look like when they get up in the morning? Do they jump out of bed? Does it take them a while? Are they stiff, but then they kind of work out of it after a few steps? All of those can be signs of pain or arthritis. Your dog used to walk around the block and now turns around at the second house down. That could be a sign that they're painful trembling when standing, and then jumping changes in cats we talked about or grooming changes. You can also learn to recognize the physical signs that your pet is showing. They do make scales for this. So this, for example, is from a grimace scale for kitty cats. Um, just, just one section of it. So there are multiple sections. This one's specifically looking at the muzzle and the whiskers. So we can see that the kitty cat on the left has really nice relaxed muzzle and whiskers. And as we move to the right, everything gets more tense and the whiskers come forward. And that's a sign of pain in cats. So you can look these scales up for cats and dogs and many other species and get a sense of what sort of body signs might they be showing me that will show me that they're in pain. Because it really does take a lot for a pet to get to the point where they're crying out or limping. They might have some more subtle signs of pain that you could notice before. Here's a really good uh, graphic for dogs. This is really more about discomfort in general in dogs, not necessarily just pain, but there are some good things here that you might see, um, such as muzzle licking is a good sign that they're uncomfortable. Pacing specifically, we see that a lot in our older pets. So just getting to know your pet's body language and what's normal for them and what's not. Another possible sign of an illness or a disease is an appetite change. You might see this as my pet's a really picky eater. He used to eat this kibble all the time, but now I'm always having to change brands because he won't finish it. Um, dropping food, drooling, all of those things can be signs of a decreased appetite or nausea. The other thing that's important to note is an increase in appetite can also be a sign of disease, especially in our kitty cat friends, if they're eating ravenously and you just can't satiate them and that's abnormal for them, that's a change that needs to be investigated. Changes in water drinking can be really important to watch out for. So you might see that as you're filling up the bowl more often, your pet's begging for water, your cat's wanting the faucet turned on, 
they're gulping a lot of water in one sitting. And one that I find is really common is most people don't see their cats drink out of the water bowl because cats don't drink a lot of water. And all of a sudden they're like, you know, I'm seeing my cat there like once a day or twice a day and I never noticed him drinking before. That could be a sign that he's drinking more water. Vomiting or diarrhea is pretty self-explanatory. This isn't, isn't normal and could represent a problem. I didn't put any picture here because it's really important for me to have the message that vomiting is never normal. Even in cats, even if it's a hairball, it's still not normal, it's vomiting. There is vomiting that is self-limiting and that's kind of a one-off that we can tolerate and monitor. But if it's vomiting, it's never normal and it's something that should be discussed with your veterinarian. Other changes we can see are accidents in the house. Certainly pets can lose their potty training as they age. It can be part of cognitive decline, but any accident in the house, especially if it's new or abnormal, should be investigated as a medical issue first. Vocalizing or yowling, more common in our kitty cats. Um, sometimes they just like to sing to the moon, um, but that can also be a sign of an underlying disease such as thyroid disease. We talked about changes in coat and grooming a lot. Um, so hair loss and things. In cats, it's important to watch out for clumpy, greasy coats. That can be a sign of some diseases. And it's also important to look out for increased grooming, just like increased and decreased appetite can be issues. Increased and decreased grooming can be issues because pets can lick or chew at areas that are itchy or painful. I mentioned a body map before. This is what a body map looks like. Um, pets commonly get lumps and bumps as they age, and so it's important for those to be documented. Sometimes they need to be sampled as well, and your veterinarian can do what's called a fine needle aspirate. It's where they take a very small needle into the mass and get some cells out to look under the microscope, and that can help us monitor those masses and let us know which ones are troublesome, which ones should be removed, and which ones can just be monitored. Behavior changes are very common as pets age. This is my um, own old lady who is sound asleep behind me right now. I mean, she's about 12 and she's had a lot of behavior changes as she's aged. Her anxiety has worsened. She's developed new phobias. Both of those things are really common. It's very common for our elderly pets to become more anxious. We can see our elderly pets decrease in their socialization eat things they didn't before. All of those things are changes and, and they need to be recognized. Cognitive decline does happen in our pets. It is recognized. So essentially this is dementia in our pets. There's a really great tool for dogs from the Purina Institute. It's called the DISHA assessment tool. And it goes through step-by-step -step all of the different categories of cognitive decline. You can actually do this with your family about your pet and get a score. Cognitive decline is important to recognize because it is treatable. It is not curable, but it is treatable. And there's a lot of things that we can do to delay the progression of it and help our pets stay sharp longer. So the overarching message of that is that change is change. Anything that's different in your pet as they age shouldn't be chalked up to just age because age is not a disease. And so it's your job to sort of be your advocate for your pet, be their voice, take your concerns to your veterinarian and chat about those. Sometimes those changes are gonna just be an aging change and we need to make an adaptation to how our pet lives. But sometimes those changes represent a disease or a chronic disease that we need to manage. So that's sort of the second part of this is once your pet gets diagnosed with a chronic disease, if they get diagnosed with a chronic disease, most of them are not curable, but they're treatable and manageable. And so this is another instance where it's important to have a good relationship with your veterinarian because, for example, Boots here has kidney disease and she was diagnosed with it several years ago and she was started on some treatment and then she gets monitored every three to four months. We take a look at her values, we look at her weight, we see how her appetite's doing and we assess many different aspects of her quality of life and make tiny little changes. And so with chronic disease, we often have to check in more frequently than every six months. And we often are having to make changes to the treatment plan to try to keep things going strong. One thing that can hinder this care in our older pets is that stress and anxiety that they get as they age. So I'm a big proponent that care is better done at home, especially for our elderly pets. And um, I have many pets that I see at home, like Norby here, who they get their exam done in their bed and they don't even get out of bed for it. Um, and so for pets that need really frequent blood work or frequent check-ins, that care done at home can be a lot less stressful for them. 
not every pet is right for at home care. Not every person wants to do at home care, which is totally fine. So then in that case, I do encourage you to look into fear free certified professionals. The fear free certification is an additional certification that is voluntary that veterinarians and other pet professionals can take. It helps us to recognize fear, anxiety, and stress in our patients, and it helps us to work to treat them in a way that is fear-free and also cooperative. So I'm a big fan of cooperative care where pets are actually volunteering to be a part of the experience and aren't forced into anything, which I think is really important for our senior pets. So I talked through a lot of different um, resources and things for you guys. This, these are a few of them here. Certainly if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. I'll have my contact up in just a second here. But one of the big things, themes throughout this whole talk was to develop a good relationship with your veterinarian. Have a veterinarian you can trust. You can ask these questions of that knows you and your pet well and will know when any changes pop up. Um, and then you'll have that good relationship as your pet ages. So here is my contact information. I'll look at the questions here in just a second. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I do have a blog that I'm starting called Ask Dr. B, where folks can send questions into me and then I respond to those questions with a, with a blog post. The other thing is that throughout this talk, any of the pets that were shown here in black and white photos, those are what I call my sage pets. So those are actual patients of mine. Um, and if you check out our website, there is a gallery of all of their beautiful old faces. So um, that is it for me. I'm happy to take any questions here. And it looks like there's a couple of things in the chat. I see that there's some pets that are 16 and a half. That's fabulous. And then there is a small dog who's 13 years old who's having some, some incessant licking. So unfortunately, I can't give you any medical advice about the licking, but I can say that that's a change we see somewhat frequently um, in our older dogs. Um, and there are things that can be done about that. So I do recommend that you chat with your veterinarian about that. Um, same thing. Uh, there's a pet here that uh, oh, Abby is going to be 19. I missed that at the beginning. Oh, my God. Good job, Abby. But she throws up several times a week. That goes under my vomiting is not normal category. And there's certainly something that can be done about that. So I do recommend checking in with your veterinarian about that. Let me see here. There's a question that says, when you say yearly lab work, is there a specific blood test to ask for? Like humans, a CBC, what would it be for animals? That's a fabulous question. So most veterinarians have what's called sort of like a senior wellness package. And sometimes it's a little bit less expensive because it comes as a package. But the things I recommend are a CBC. So absolutely, it's called the same thing, a complete blood cell count. A chemistry panel that at the very minimum is going to look at your kidney values, your liver values, and your electrolytes. And then for our older pets, I always include thyroid function too. We should always be checking that thyroid once a year. So those are the three things that I think are most important. Um, let's see. Thanks, Nicole, you are also the best. And then this, the fear-free certification. You know, that's a great question. I know fear-free certification um, is for veterinary professionals. I think they're working on having something for pet parents as well. I think it's called like fear-free homes or something like that. If you just Google fear-free, you should be able to find some information. And if you can't, then uh, let me know and I'll help you look. But I think they are developing some stuff for pet owners as well. Oh, and I miss you too, Lucy Ann Page. Awesome. Um, I'm not seeing other questions here. Eric, help me out if I'm missing anything. Um, no, I think you've pretty much covered all of them. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking this. I'm actually, I do have a couple questions of my own, if you don't mind me asking. Okay. And I don't have a Yeah, pet, no but, problem. You know, I think we mentioned <laughs> pets in a while. But um, for older dogs, should we change their diet from like a harder food to like a softer food, uh, something that's either wet or like mushier, like in case they have jaw issues or anything along those lines? Yeah, I think that's a fabulous question. So certainly as our pets age, we want to think about switching them to a senior based diet. So there are diets that are for puppies and then for adults and then for seniors. So we want to think about switching them to a senior diet as they get there for calorie restriction and then for a few other reasons. In terms of crunchies versus not crunchies, it's really dog dependent. Believe it or not, kibble does help clean the teeth. It sounds weird, like I'm rubbing food on my teeth. How is that going to clean it? But it does help break up that biofilm. And so I'm a proponent of kibble if you can keep them on it at least partially. Um, 
But certainly increasing moisture can be important. So adding water to the food or adding some wet food on top can be good, but there's really no reason an elderly dog cannot eat kibble. Um, like I said, my cat who has no teeth, he's about to be 14. He still prefers kibble. He just swallows it whole and that's what he wants. So <laughs> there's really no reason you have to switch. Gotcha. Oh, so I see that Linda is actually asking if there's a brand of senior food that you would recommend. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, in terms of brands of food, this is a great question because there are so many pet foods out there and I could probably do six webinars just about pet food specifically. Um, and there are lots of regulations behind things, but not everybody has one, a veterinary nutritionist on staff, and not everybody tests their food before they feed it. So for example, a company can make a food, it fits a recipe and they can sell it and a dog has never eaten it before. So I like to stick to three different brands that I know meet those criteria. And those are Hills, Royal Canin and Purina. Those are really my favorite ones. I make a little bit of an exception for From because it's a local company that I have a lot of experience with. Um, but anything from those brands should be good. Gosh, yeah, actually, we have a couple more questions coming in. So it says, Alrighty. Tom, uh, would you recommend the things one glues over the dog's nails over the booty or the booties? Oh, yeah. So I do like the, you're talking about the, the toe grips for traction for your senior dogs. I do really like those because um, they're not, Dogs just hate booties on their feet. I think they feel like their foot is stuck in something. And so the, the toe grips are nice for that. The toe grips stay on all the time so they can go out in like the mud and then come in and all that sort of stuff. But um, toe grips don't work for everybody and some dogs don't like them. So booties are always another great option as well. I think booties are great. Gotcha. And then, another... and I think, sorry, I was just going to add one more thing is that in this yeah. dog, it sounds like the dog's also dragging her feet a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And so sometimes booties can be good there to protect the foot too. Nice. I mean, if you if you see the questions there, I don't know. If you want the, <laughs> the next one's yeah. on the list. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm a little bit of time um, here. There's a question about vaccinations. That's a really, that's a sort of doctor and patient and client conversation. Um, vaccines are some are necessary every year, some are not. It's very individual. And so I encourage you to talk to your veterinarian about that one. Um, if a dog is on heartworm year round, why is an annual test needed? And um, that's a great question. So that recommendation actually comes from the American Heartworm Society. The reason is because even if a dog is on annual heartworm prevention, there can still be cases of heartworm disease. Not every medicine is 100% effective. And so the reason we test is because that is another disease that if caught early, we can treat it. And if we let it go on, it can cause heart failure. The other thing is your heartworm test every year is paired with your flea and tick disease test. And so we're looking for Lyme disease and other diseases carried by ticks that could um, show up on that test as well. Yeah. And Tammy actually asked, uh, I don't know if you, would, if you would be able to give an answer to this. Um, is there a range that we should be paying for routine heartworm exams, et cetera? Oh, yeah. Well, so so charging can be very different across the board, and it's going to depend a little bit about where you're going to. Right. So there are costs that are or there are clinics that are specifically low costs. You're going to have your average kind of run of the mill clinic. You're going to have specialty clinics of in home clinics. They all have sort of going to have different costs associated with them. Um, so I don't have a good amount to give you. But what I would say is everybody should be very upfront with that and they should be able to give you over the phone or via email an idea of what an exam and vaccines is going to cost for them so you can do your research there and sort of see what fits with your budget perfect and if i could just ask you one last question here before we sure the 45 the 45 minute mark um you know how older people usually get colder over the winter months you know being here in wisconsin should we bundle <laughs> up our <laughs> with like jackets or clothing or you know maybe bundle them up a little more as the colder months come around yeah, I certainly think that that's important depending upon your, your creature, right? So um, if you have a Malamute, for example, they're going to love the winter. They're going to be fine. They have this huge thick coat, no problem. But if you have a dog, like a hound dog, like I have that just has a single coat, they might need some extra help there in staying warm. Um, and interestingly, dogs only sweat through their feet. They don't sweat anywhere else. So they do lose a lot of heat through their feet. So in the wintertime, just having booties on your dog to protect their feet and to also keep the like ice and um, snow melt and stuff off their feet can be really important. So I think that's important to think about as long as you're not annoying them too much and not causing them to overheat. It's good to keep them warm in the winter. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you all for, for joining us. And, uh, you know, just a few words on our way out. Uh, here at Dream Bank, we truly believe in the power of dreams and celebrate that our community is made up of fearless dreamers. As we wrap up, we actually like to ask our speakers one last question. And that is, what is one piece of advice, actually, that you have for someone who is pursuing a dream right now? I think the the thing that's helped me the most, because this creating this business and seeing these pets has been my dream, is to just begin. When I first thought about it, I was like, there's no way, like, there's no way I could do that. And who's going to listen to me? And who am I? And all of these negative things. And I just started. I just made one small step towards it. And then it just starts to snowball. Um, and so I would say just get started. If you have a dream and you feel passionate, just make one tiny step towards it and, and the rest will come together. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all again to who to, uh, for all of you who tuned in. Uh, we look forward to continue to learn, grow, and dream together. You can learn more about upcoming Dream Bank events and content design with your dreams in mind at anthem.com slash dreambank and by connecting with us on our social channels. Uh, lastly, on behalf of American Family Insurance and Dream Bank, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Until then, keep dreaming fearlessly and thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.